Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to uh, a beautiful, a beautiful day in April. April, uh, which brings all the flowers and brings all the pollen and brings all of the dust. And then finally, because it's wet, all the mold and maybe even the topic of our discussion today with uh, aspergillosis so, um, or aspergillus. So it's my pleasure to introduce one of our uh, most esteemed uh, veteran uh, physicians that everybody uh, has a great respect for, Dr. Juan Guardiola, who basically is the pulmonary uh, person at the VA uh, for years and years and is known for teaching day in and day out, attending every code. So it's really it's really nice for me to say good morning to you and then let you introduce our speaker, Dr. Bobby. Juan? Uh, Dr. Can't... Guardiola, you're on. I don't think we can hear you at the moment. No? Yeah, Can you hear me now? Yep. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Okay. You're on. So it, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bog de Moldovano. Dr. Bobby uh, graduated from uh, University of um, Louisville Medical School, then uh, did uh, residency in um, internal medicine at uh, Indiana University, and came back to University of Louisville for a fellowship in uh, pulmonary critical care and sleep. Uh, he's been a great asset to, uh, to our division. Uh, his um, his all-terrain vehicle boarded in uh, internal medicine, pulmonary, critical care, and sleep. He's very hardworking, indefatigable. He really cares about uh, his patients, and he loves to teach fellows and and residents, and never turns anybody down. And um, topic again is pulmonary aspergillosis, a spectrum of disease. Please give him a hand. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're today we're going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, we're just going to a very brief view of pulmonary disease due to aspergillus. Our goals today are to discuss the common presentations of aspergillus disease in the lungs discuss the common diagnostic methods, and discuss treatment options and duration. So aspergillus is a saprophytic uh, uh, filamentous mold, ubiquitous in uh, saprotrophic uh, filamentous molds, ubiquitous in nature that grow in soil, mostly in decaying vegetation and water. There's multiple uh, species. Uh, biologist Pierre Antonio Michelli, viewing the fungi under the microscope, was reminded of the shape of an aspergillium, um, which is a holy water sprinkler. It's an asexual spore forming structure common to all the aspergillus uh, species. And, it's, and this is often found in environments of uh, aerobic, high osmotic pressure, there's high concentration of sugar, salt, etc. Um, the species of aspergillus that cause human illness, uh, the most common is, uh, uh, is aspergillus fumigatus, um, and it is especially known to cause disease in immunodeficient humans. Um, uh, aspergillus flavus is well known as a um, major producer of cardiogenic aflatoxins in crops worldwide. Uh, in, Af in Africa, the aflatoxin is usually found in grain stored in silos, and combined with the very high rate of hepatitis C, uh, produces a uh, high rate of hepatocellular carcinoma. But it also acts in, uh, as an opportunistic human and animal pathogen um, in immunocompromised uh, individuals. Alentulus also does the same thing, and it's also... It's specifically known for very high mortality rates. Aspergillus niger is the probably most important of the agricultural pests, but it can rarely cause disease, invasive disease in immunocompromised folks. 
Um, also, fumigatus is well known for causing allergies. Um, the in soil uh, where it naturally grows, aspergillus has a sexual life cycle. However, in um, human disease, it basically involves uh, the uh, asexual reproduction, uh, which is this aspergillum making spores, conidia spores, which uh, when inhaled become hyphae. Um, remember that in tissue biopsies, such as the ones we see to the left here, that it, the hyphae are very septated and the branching is very, is narrow angle, which they seem to love to ask on exams for some reason. So the inhalation of conidia occurs all the time into the lung. However, as you can see, the ciliated cells, healthy ciliated cells, usually just expel the conidia out of the lung. However, if the cells are damaged, usually by irradiation, chemotherapy, uh, corticosteroids, and other inflammatory medication, they can penetrate through the basement membrane and uh, develop in and germinate into hyphae. Um, they colonize uh, the healthy, surrounding healthy tissue uh, by uh, protease, which degrade um, and they are engulfed into macrophages where rather than having the phagosome turn into the lysosome, they prevent that and they are actually carried around by the macrophages. The uh, conidia themselves do not trigger a significant uh, inflammatory response. Uh, it only occurs after uh, they, as the hyphae begin to grow, they begin to invade host endothelial cells of the pulmonary capillaries. The fragments break off, you can see in this picture, as they're growing into this vessel. Um, the hyphal fragments uh, will then ad adhere to endothelium distally and uh, grow outwards, spreading the infection. Um, the immune response in immunocompetent patients is usually enough to prevent, uh, there's a innate defense against the aspergillus, the macrophages use reactive oxygen species, they uh, recruit PMNs to the site also, uh, which uh, secrete reactive oxygen species killing the, the fungus and uh, natural killer cells seek out infected cells and kill them directly. Um, there is also a significant adaptive immune response where the dendritic cells phagocytize both A. fumigatus canidia and hyphae, uh, and they produce the combination of dendritic cells and IFT cells, produce cytokine IL-12, which uh, ma matures it into a Th1 helper cell, which helps with fungal elimination. Um, and IL-4 and IL-10, which unfortunately differentiate into a Th2 cell, which is significant in the pathogenesis of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, as it causes a uh, allergic type response. Um, the aspergillus uh, infection can involve a variety of organ systems. Here we see some keratitis, ENS abscesses and dermal in, infection. However, we're going to fo focus on respiratory problems with um, caused by aspergillus. Um, it causes a spectrum of pulmonary diseases. Uh, it's determined by the interaction between a pathogen, the underlying three things: pathogen, underlying lung disease, and the host immunity. At one end of the spectrum, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis predominantly affects patients with severe impairment of the immune system, um, such as uh, T-cell dysfunction. Uh, chronic pulmonary aspergillosis uh, 
affects folks with underlying lung disease without absence of that kind of immune dysfunction. Uh, immu acute community acquired aspergillosis occurs without almost any immune dysfunction, but where you have a nor massive inoculation. Uh, aspergillus bronchitis presents as a chronic bronchitis in patients without immunocompromise, but with airways other than structural damage. Uh, and ABPA is related to this. It occurs due to a hypersensitivity to the inhaled aspergillus, mostly asthmatic. So those are the what we're going to talk be talking about today. Um, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is a acute progressive infection that occurs in severely immunocompromised patients, has a high associated mortality. A uh, typical uh, risk factor you think of is in neutropenia. The longer uh, the severity of the neutropenia, uh, the more impressive it is. Uh, you get angioinvasion present, um, but this also occurs in uh, transplant patients, in AIDS, uh, and these don't usually have quite a, do not have evidence of significant angioinvasion. Um, more recently, it's been diagnosed in critically ill non-neutropenic patients with non-specific risk factors, um, such as uh, patients who have been in the ICU and have had multiple antibiotic treatments. The criteria, the gold standard diagnosis for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is microscopic analysis of the material on a transbronchial biop on a sterile material. Um, there's a recent trial done on suspected VAP in UK ICUs, which 12.4% uh, met criteria for probable aspergillus infection. So it should definitely be considered in patients with suspected uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia or hospitals. Um, the, um, there's a lot of difficulty uh, in obtaining uh, biopsy in otherwise fragile patients. Therefore, uh, in patients with severe immunocompromise, such as neutropenia uh, or a hematological malignancy and presenting with um, unexplained lung infiltrates, there is a strong recommendation for serum galactomannan testing and serum aspergillus PCR. Um, if those are negative, then uh, obtaining the aspergillus PCR in the bronchoalveolar lavage with the bronchoscopy is strongly recommended. And this shows a um, transbronchial biopsy showing the angioinvasion by aspergillus, and uh, we talked about galactomannan being a cell wall polysaccharide, which is released by growing aspergillus hyphae as um, uh, opposed to the beta glucan, which is, can be seen um, if, which is not often seen with that, it can be seen just from the uh, cell walls of other fungi and the canidia. Um, there are basically one of the three following things that you can see on CT scan, which are supportive diagnostic criteria. You can see a dense nodule with or without a halo sign. The halo sign suggests that there is angioinvasion. You can see the air crescent sign uh, with necrotic material in a cavity, or you can see just a cavity uh, itself. The treatment uh, of it has been primarily voriconazole ever since 2002, which showed improved uh, uh, treatment, improved survival in patients with treated with voriconazole compared to MFOB. Uh, alternative therapies uh, include uh, the liposomal amphotericin B in folks who where you do not have a good 
uh, response uh, or isoviconium zonium sulfate. Uh, for those that are resistant to azoles, you can do a combination of an okidocandin and voriconazole. Uh, the treatment is long-term. It's recommended for at least uh, six, six weeks up to 12 weeks. Let's talk a little bit about tracheal bronchial aspergillosis. It's a specific presentation of invasive aspergillosis, mainly described in AIDS patients and uh, lung transplant recipients. It comes in kind of three flavors. You can have thick aspergillus mucus plugs without bronchial inflammation, as you can see on this CT scan over here. You can have uh, extensive involvement of the airways with lots of pseudomembranes forming over the mucosa, or you can find uh, all significant ulcerations, which usually have a relatively poor prognosis at the anastomotic suture line in the lung transplant recipients. Let's look at them a minute. The bronchoscopic view of obstructive just shows thick, tenacious mucus plugs with fungal hyphae present in the um, um, mucus, and there is no significant ulceration after removal. Pseudomembranous TBA shows a uh, layer uh, of um, what appears to be a membrane. However, when you go under high power and uh, images, you see that it is basically inflammatory exudate with fungal hyphae that are uh, present in the pseudomembrane. Uh, the uh, ulcerative TBA, this is the Really the only picture I could find of this showing um, uh, the ulceration. Uh, the diagnosis is made by combination of biopsies uh, and uh, microbiological growth and pathological analysis. Um, how do you treat this? Similar to IPA with vorbicomazole or liposomal alpha amphotericin B, as well as uh, debridement of the uh, airway lesions with bronchoscopy. Um, it, the, these pictures show a kind of before and after treatment. Uh, you have a prolonged duration of 6 to 12 months. Uh, you, in lung transplant recipients, uh, you can do inhaled amphotericin B um, for um, at least three months or until you have complete resolution of tracheal bronchial aspergillosis. Okay. Similar, uh, you can have neutropenic fever in patients with cancer. Um, there is recommendations from the Infectious Disease Society of America for empiric antifungal therapy for high-risk neutropenia in patients uh, with persistent or recurrent fevers um, after four to seven days of broad-spectrum empiric antibiotics. Uh, <clears throat> the high risk is, the risk factors are high-risk neutropenia, hemodynamic instability uh, can be found in these folks. You can, it's, you should be concerned when they have gastrointestinal symptoms such as abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, or new onset neurological changes. Um, there, the next the thing that we want to talk about is chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. As you can see from this, from Denning's chart, this shows a significant overlap over the different type. The progression is slow. Uh, it affects patients with underlying chronic lung conditions, um, such as emphysema and fibrocavitary lung in general. Um, most of the time, we think of it as starting as chronic cavitary pulmonary aspergillosis and then differentiating into uh, several of these different types. 
Um, the clinical criteria is severe symptoms for three months, no significant immunocompromise. Uh, there are cavitary pulmonary lesions, as we can see. This is the most common form. Um, the cavities can either be new found or they are expanding from those previous cavitaries that we talked about, including the ones from COPD and from um, TB, et cetera. And we have laboratory criteria that shows positive precipitins uh, or IgG to aspergillus or isolation of aspergillus from the cavity. Um, the concern is that it may progress to chronic fibrosing pulmonary aspergillosis if left untreated, which can significantly damage the lungs. And here we have both a, a, a coronal and a, a regular views of a that. And this one actually shows another type, which is an aspergilloma uh, presenting in here in the fibrosis. Um, less frequent times you can find a simple aspergilloma and uh, more often are just regular aspergillus nodules. The subacute version is uh, known as chronic necrotizing aspergillosis. Usually it de develops very relatively quickly within four to 12 weeks, unlike the others which usually take long and three months to develop. Um, it manifests like any of the others, including cavitation, nodules, consolidation, and abscess formation. For chronic and uh, cavitation and fibrosing, you need a six minimum of six months of antifungal therapy with itraconazole or voriconazole. You can use posiconazole as alternative therapy, and the subacute form should be treated exactly the same as invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. Um, a aspergilloma, if it is asymptomatic, you may just elect to do a wait and see. Uh, however, for good surgical candidates, resection is definitive therapy. Uh, for patients that are poor surgical candidates, uh, you can instill amphotericin B um, into the cavity to help control hemoptysis and uh, catheter embolization of the bronchial arteries may be performed uh, for the recurrent life-threatening hemoptysis, but however the treatment is surgical resection. Um, the uh, Treatment of the aspergillus nodules, a single nodule that has been excised does not really need any further treatment. Um, the mole, uh, if the nodules progress in size, uh, azole therapy is indicated and a, a repeat biopsy should be considered to rule out uh, malignancy in patients who are immunocompromised or become immunocompromised. Azole therapy should be uh, considered. Um, aspergillus bronchitis is basically a chronic superficial infection of the bronchial tree in non immunos compromised patients, usually who have pre existing, uh, who, who have previous bronchiectasis or history of cystic fibrosis. Um, it, Essential criteria for diagnosis is that you have more than four weeks of pulmonary symptoms, no significant immune system deficiency, and demonstration of aspergillus in the airways. Um, the uh, bronchoscopic findings usually are thick tenacious mucus with bronchial plugging, uh, bronchial erythema, and ulceration, and usually Aspergillus antibodies is detectable in serum, but not always. The treatment of aspergillus bronchitis uh, is oral azole therapy for at least four months in most patients. However, 
uh, much like Mac, there is a uh, close to 50% relapse uh, risk in, uh, and patient may need long-term suppressive therapy. So what about uh, folks who have a large inoculation of Aspergillus canidia from the environment? Basically, you see this in three different kind of presentations. You have a mulch pneumonitis, folks who, workers who, ex, who are exposed to m m significant amount of mulch, uh, massive exposure to these airborne spores will, can and will overwhelm the immune system. Um, in patients that are, uh, that are post-influenza or that are COPD patients, most of which are on systemic corticosteroids, the amount of exposure can be much less. Uh, this presents as an acute pneumonitis, and here in this x-ray, you can see uh, this one is at presentation, and two months later where you can see a diffuse um, nodular infiltrate, which usually resolves, um, you have miliary pattern uh, is very often uh, the diagnosis is made by isolation of aspergillus from BAL uh, or combination of serum galactamanin and aspergillus PCR uh, uh, or BAL galactamanin and aspergillus PCR. The treatment, as this has a very high mortality rate, uh, Prompt treatment is recommended. Second line is with amphotericin biocasper fungin. Early diagnosis is uh, essential. And if properly treated, usually these will resolve without significant fibrosis or chronic lung damage. Um, but you have to get on it really quickly. Let's talk about our last. Um, thing, which is um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. It's caused by a hypersensitivity to aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, it affects patients with asthma and cystic fibrosis. Uh, uh, you see it with COPD and tuberculous fibrocavitary disease. Um, you see it with distinct clinical radiographic manifestations. Keyword here is recurring fleeting infiltrates, as well as pr presence of refractory asthma, and it can be seen with or without bronchiectasis. Um, there has been several uh, groups that have proposed new criteria for diagnosis of ABPA. Um, usually, you start with a patient with uh, significant bronchial asthma with uh, aspergillus fumigatus IgE levels greater than 0.35. The total IgE needs to be elevated. Some sources say greater than 1,000 international units, but uh, it can also occur that down to 500 in the international units per milliliter, um, as well as um, an eosinophil count and uh, that is greater than, according to some sources, greater than 1,000 cells, but all, the newer criteria say it has, should be greater than 500 cells. And uh, the aspergillus fumigatus IgG uh, level greater than 27, um, or if the aspergillus fumigatus specific IgE test is not available, um, you can do a aspergillus type 1 reactivity skin test. Following this, you should obtain a high-resolution CT scan to sh that either shows high attenuation mucus, bronchiectasis, or, or no active disease. If there is no active disease, then uh, you can diagnose basically a serologic allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, CT scan shows 
significant central bronchiectasis. Uh, there is, you, you see things like the signet ring uh, and a string of pearls. Um, the um, other image shows a high attenuated mucus impaction, the finger in glove opacities, um, and as well as um, you can see a tree in bud appearance uh, with this kind of central lobular nodularity. Um, the treatment it usually goes in several stages if you the cornerstone of treatment for abpa is to treat uh for uh with four months of glucocorticoids um and follow up radiograph to see improvement in total ige levels uh see stability of spirometry if the patient uh, is fine, then you can, and is able to stay off of steroids for six months, then you would uh, basically call it a remission and continue to observe the patient. If you have recurrent exacerbations, you would do steroids for four months and nitroconazole four months. Uh, the if the patient has recurrent exacerbations and becomes treatment dependent, um, you would treat with um, long-term azoles such as itraconazole, uh, voriconazole, and postaconazole may be effective. Uh, when you're using those, you should monitor for evidence of hepatotoxicity. Um, the um, Omeluzumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against IgE, may work in patients with ABPA and poorly controlled asthma. Um, the, uh, and so in conclusions, the spectrum of disease uh, results from the interaction of aspergillus and the immune status and or the underlying disease of the host ranging from invasive pulmonary aspergillosis to aspergillus bronchitis, uh, and one form may uh, evolve into another depending on the uh, severity of the, of the immunity, the immune status of the patient. Um, thank you very much for uh, listening to me today, and do you all have any questions? Bobby, um, I, of course, uh, I like to ask questions, and I see people are going to uh, probably maybe go in the chat, and Jason will be taking a look at that. I have a prevention question. It's probably a ridiculous one, given how ubiquitous these yes. spores are in the environment. But if someone is a has chronic COPD or is on corticosteroids, should they be uh, you know, to having HEPA filters in their home, uh, you know, does that actually reduce the incidence? I do, to my knowledge, I don't think anyone has studied that. One would think that, that it would, uh, in, obviously in asthma, uh, just asthma treatment, uh, the, uh, removal of, uh, mold from the house uh, and from the environment significantly improves. So I would think that having having uh, a HEPA filter and reducing the uh, number of uh, the the canidia spores which are involved. So I would I would say uh, I don't know, but I would certainly think so. And I don't know if Robert Emons is on the uh, call because he likes to ask about microbiota and with the interaction of, of microbiota and immune function of various organs, including the lung now, that would be my other question. Is there any uh, uh, probiotic um, literature also for prevention? That That is a very... That's fascinating. Um, the you would the the reason 
basically we're since we're inhaling these um spores and uh the, the innate immune system uh, especially the physical immune system with the ciliary elevator uh is a um kind of the hallmark of how these would be uh what do you call it how does how the spores are uh removed before they have a chance to germinate um that's a, again i don't have a, a very good answer that's a that's a fascinating idea we have chat any chat questions anybody yes uh, Yes, uh, ladies, uh, Dr. Krieger mentioned if you have a question, you can you can type it in the chat area and we can read it for Dr. Bobby, or you can unmute your microphone and ask a question. Well, Dr. Krieger, I was going to say, it looks like a uh, yeah. Uh, he did it. He did such a good job. There's he, he covered all the bases. We now know everything we need to know. Now that was very, very, very good and very well presented, Bobby. I, I was thank very you. Well presented. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a great, um, a great week, uh, Jason. We're here next week with. Mm -hmm. It'll be uh, 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 our yeah. presentation next week will be a, 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 uh, on uh, from nephrology. From nephrology. Okay. All righty. Uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. It was, it was my pleasure. Good, good. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Bobby. And thank again, you. Dr. And Dr. Kruger mentioned thank you to everybody. And again, uh, next week, 8 a.m., uh, next Thursday. And again, it'll be uh, our topic. It will be a nephrology topic. So we'll, uh, we'll let everybody know uh, we'll let everybody know soon. So again, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Thank you, sir. Bye.